So I th just let me check on our Facebook feed. I think we're broadcasting there. So have, have you been, I, I've seen some of your, your COVID work um, mm -hmm. and I really like what I, I saw you post, uh, you were posting some comments about, you know, having some positive images out of that as well, not just, you know, some of the, some of the really jarring images we've seen. What, what has been your experience, uh, you know, covering the coronavirus? Well, um, I think in the beginning, it just presented itself as so surreal um, before, you know, the patients started piling up in New York City hospitals, just uh, the landscape was so different and, and there was a real sense of um, on my feeling of anxiety, like what, what I'm seeing today may not exist tomorrow. And so um, I think my pictures were sort of less informational and more reflective at first. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then I followed, um, you know, the nurses' protests. I was not photographing on assignment inside hospitals, um, so I didn't do that work. But the nurses' protests were quite um, um, powerful for me because you could see how they were trying to do an impossible job and also felt quite threatened and not supported by their employers. And so one of the things the pandemic has revealed is the fragility of the underlying system and hopefully we'll come out of this with, um, you know, um, a commitment to remaking uh, what we have today, as opposed to just continuing the way we've been going. So uh, I photographed those demonstrations. Uh, it already seems like a zillion years ago, two weeks from now, because now New York City is in a completely different moment. Yeah, it's just right? changing so rapidly. Let me take a second and, and welcome people to the room. Um, well, welcome everyone to the room. We're going to be starting up in just a minute. Um, uh, just letting uh, a few more people trickle in. So this is, um, this is exciting. You know, um, Maggie Stever sent me an email last year and, and said, you've got to get Nina on your, on your festival. And we'd already completely filled up our, um, our speaker lineup last year. Uh, but you were one of the first people I wrote this year when we were we were planning um, planning this year's festival, which unfortunately the in person part got canceled. So so glad to have you. Um, uh, I just want to thank you because I was really looking forward to being in D.C. with everyone. But I just want to you know really give all respect to you and to the photographic institutions and the art institutions that are trying to keep our community together at this time and for organizing. This event it's we're all busy with things and so I know that it's it's not an easy moment for anybody so I just want to really thank you deeply for um, trying to keep the community together and for putting this on thank you we're, we're gonna start right now <sighs> welcome everyone thanks for joining us today um, and I don't think anyone is gonna be disappointed with our conversation about Nina's um, groundbreaking book uh, an autobiography of Miss Wish. Uh, before we get started, just uh, um, want to do a couple um, comments on on what's happening. Uh, I think we we all know that there's an incredible amount of pain um, happening right now in the country. Uh, we're completely aware of of um, of the calls for justice and the need for reform and change and in and, and, and in some cases you know creating a new system so i, I do want to i do want to um i do want to acknowledge that before we go on because obviously everything that's happening um is is not happening in a vacuum so we acknowledge that um i i, I do want to um also say that nina was going to be one of our keynote speakers at our our photo festival this year we had to Cancel that, of course, because of the um, situation with the coronavirus. Um, but I'm so happy that we are able to bring her here and have her present the talk to even a wider audience. Uh, Nina Berman is a documentary photographer, filmmaker, author, and educator. Her wide-ranging work looks at American politics, militarism, 
Post-Violence Trauma and Resilience. Her photographs and videos have been exhibited at more than 100 venues. She's the author of Purple Hearts, Back from Iraq, Portraits and, that's Portraits and Interviews with Wounded American Veterans. She also published Homeland, an exploration of the militarization of American life post-September 11th. And of course, her most recent book, Not Autobiography of Miss Wish. Um, Nina, it is a pleasure to have you. Um, my job today is mostly to get out of your way and let you take it over. Um, I do want to tell people that if you do have questions for Nina, we're going to have Q&A after her talk. And the best way to do that is to go to the bottom of your screen, find the Q&A box, and please put your uh, questions in there. If you put them in chat, um, I'm likely to miss them or lose track of them. So please put your questions on there. Um, Nina, the stage is yours. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Joe. Uh, thank you all for being here today and taking time out from your life um, for this conversation. I'm, um, I'm gonna run through this very complicated story around the protagonist of this book, Miss um, Wish, otherwise known as Kimberly Stevens, uh, my dear friend of now going on 30 years. And also, I guess more importantly, talk to you about process in making the book of choosing when to photograph, when not to photograph, uh, whether I should even put out a book, how to do that in a way that's ethical, that doesn't harm myself, doesn't harm Kim, um, and how to really consider this practice of collaborative photography. Um, and what does collaboration mean? Is it just, hi, do you wanna do this work with me? Or are you co-authors with control and um, shared concerns. So um, with that, um, I'm gonna switch to this PowerPoint and hold on. Um, is my screen shared or do I have to do that, Joe? Uh, Sorry, it's not shared yet. You, you, you okay. need um, Is that good? Can you all see it? Joe, yes. Do you see it? You, okay. you we can see you, you, you'll need to hit uh, play from start just to- Yeah, is that good? You just have the cover. Yeah, okay. you're good. Thanks. Um, okay, here we go. Um, this is 1990. I am a, I'm a photographer in New York. I was born here. I still live here, spent most of my life here. But in uh, 1990, I'm kind of at the start of my career. I'm using transparency film. I'm starting to photograph for magazines, mainly Time, Newsweek, New York Magazine. and I decided I'm going to go to London kind of on a whim uh, with this really vague idea of photographing the end of Maggie Thatcher era. You know, we had just come out of the Reagan era and I was seeing things starting to happen in London that I was, that had already happened in New York, mainly um, the widespread use of crack cocaine, um, homelessness, deeper poverty. And so I went to London, to do this vague story, not on assignment, and also because I had a free place to stay there. Um, my older sister used to live in London. She was actually a squatter in London. And so London was also, in my mind, a place of, you know, young people and squatters. And so when I got there, what I kind of looked for was kids on the street. And at that time in London, there were hundreds of them. And um, I would wander around just, making pictures. One night I came upon the scene of this girl knocking on the door of a hostel, screaming, let me in. And um, I took her picture and she said, who are you? I'm like, oh, my name's Nina. I'm from New York. And that was the beginning of a 30 year friendship, uh, an unlikely one, but one I'm very grateful for. And so I started following her. She called herself Kathy at the time. I started following her around London, really with no clear plan just to try and learn, see how her life was. Um, remember there are no cell phones then, so, and no like pagers really. So if you make an appointment to meet somebody, you just wait until they show up. And, um, and to do that with someone who's homeless, you know, sometimes they show up, sometimes they don't. Kathy would always show up. So um, she used to, 
hustle for money on the street. Um, she'd sleep out in the rough. She had a friend named Esther. Um, and so I went on like this for a, you know, a couple of weeks. She also used crack, which was very um, unusual in London at the time. And she would smoke it in the um, basement of a, in the bottom of a car park. Um, she started um, revealing to me that people were chasing her, that people had done bad things to her, that she was frightened, um, that someone had stabbed her, that this wasn't the only wound on her body. And, um, and so, and I wasn't sure like what the story was. It was some vague thing about some guy named Mark and maybe her parents were involved. So after a few weeks of this, I, um, I left London. I said to her, okay, um, here's my phone number and my address and get in touch and you know, we'll stay in touch. And then I brought the pictures back to New York and I showed them to picture editors and they were you know, uninterested. And I just pretty much put them in my closet. So um, she would write to me. This is how, for those of us old enough to remember, this is how people used to communicate before, you know, um, internet. And we would write each other and I would keep track of her. And uh, she, then, she then said to me, that's six, seven months later, Nina, hey, I won a contest on, um, I'm gonna come and visit you in New York. Can I stay for a little while? And this, I know this part of the story, people are like, huh? Why did you say yes? Or, or what were you thinking? But actually to me, it just seemed very normal. So I was like, yeah, you can come and stay for, um, for a couple of weeks or however long. And um, I thought I would take her around New York. So she stayed at my apartment. She brought her teddy bear. And I took a few pictures here and there. And, um, and then she had a nightmare. And she was kind of screaming, no, no. And I could see in the nightmare that someone was hurting her. And I took a few pictures. And then I stopped. And I felt completely uncomfortable photographing her in that way. Um, and then later on, um, she had a flashback. And she was trying to run. And I was afraid she might jump out my window. And I realized that whatever she was going through, I really wasn't prepared to help her. And um, I felt unsafe, actually. And I helped her get back to Kennedy Airport and to go back to London. Um, and so we kept in touch still. And at some point she sent me uh, a big envelope with diaries, um, with um, pages from a diary she had been keeping that detailed some of the violence that was done against her. Um, and it was stories of, you know, um, sexual violence, of being forced to carry drugs. It's, it's a very in-depth tale. In the book, it's revealed in a very slow, um, um, how do I say it? A very slow way where you, you have the choice to learn everything or the choice not to learn everything. And I think when telling stories about sexual violence or childhood trauma, it's, you have to be very careful about how much information you put out and how you put that information out. And so um, it, it's not something that should be consumed easily. So in the book, for those of you who maybe have it or those of you who want to get it, the reader will have to do the work if they want to learn the whole story. Um, anyway, so she, she sent me um, these documents and I kept them in my apartment and I didn't really think much of them and I thought, oh, okay, I'll just have them. And at that moment, I actually became and, and have all these years become, in fact, her archivist and the keeper of her positions. Um, and these um, documents also included medical files that she sent me. So, um, so we kind of went on like this for like about two years and then she came to New York um, again, fleeing um, a very dangerous situation in London. And um, she's been here since and became a ward of New York State. And when she returned the second time, 
she was not a photographic subject for me. She had just become a person in my life. And except for this picture I took um, in Times Square, I believe in 1994, and little pictures I took for myself at home, you know, with my family and her, um, I pretty much stopped photographing her. And I, w I was doing other things and I, um, again, she was no longer a subject. She was just a person in my life. Um, New York City at that time, for those of you who remember, was uh, in the midst of a major, I don't want to call it a, a crack health crisis. You could get crack for, you know, $2.50. It was everywhere. I was quite concerned that because of her past use in London, she was going to come to New York and it was going to be a kind of irresistible place for her. And that's in fact what happened. And um, yeah. So as a word of the state, um, authorities tried to help her and she was placed in a couple of different institutions and she started drawing pictures and then would send me these pictures um, when she would go from one institution to the next. And these pictures became her way of um, telling her story and what happened to her as a child. She also, all through this time, would always collect documentation on herself. Um, I see it as her way to assert this really happened, also assert that, her, that she was consistently trying to ask for help. Um, inevitably, at some point, um, she was arrested and put on Rikers Island and um, um, tried to commit suicide there. And I visited her in the hospital, you know, where she was chained to the bed. And so my, my, during this time, it would be, I'd be very involved for a period of time with her and then kind of pull back. And for anyone out there, and I'm sure there are many people in the audience who either themselves or a, have a loved one or a friend who's has post-traumatic stress, who maybe has mental illness or addiction, you know that it can be a complex navigation because um, what's at stake is so deep and the, um, the desire from me as a friend and also from Kim to try and feel better is so great. Um, so after Rikers, um, she got her first little apartment and, um, she also, um, you know, had become HIV positive and I thought, wow, I've known this woman now for so long and I have so few pictures of her and I think she might die and I need pictures of her for myself, not for the public, not for anyone to see, but for myself. And I started to very focused, very intently, intensely photographing her again. So every time I saw her now, I photographed her too. And um, I'm grateful that I came to make that decision because I needed these photographs and she needed them as well. Um, you can see in this picture, like she would put up photographs of us together. So these are pictures of my daughter, pictures of um, me. Um, if it's not clear already, it's probably clear now, I am an active participant in the story. I am not a neutral, dispassionate observer. Some of these pictures would not have happened if I wasn't involved, right? But I never did things like, oh, I'm going to get Kim to go into the hospital so I can photograph her, right? This picture is because I helped get her into the hospital so she could have help, and then while visiting her, I took a few pictures, right? So I just want that to be clear. And I've always been open that I am, my, our friendship helped to shape this narrative. So um, it's 2014 
And um, yeah, it's 2014 and I'm offered a residency at a place called the Blue Mountain Center. If people don't know it, do look it up. It's this very, very special place in the Adirondacks. And it provides a space for photographers, filmmakers, writers, just to have a quiet room and uh, a nice community. And so I was offered a short-term residency for people working on stories of sexual violence. And I decided at that moment to take every bit of material that I had collected and created about Kim and spend a couple of weeks. And this included videos, um, objects, documents, photographs, texts, diary journals. Um, yeah. And see if I could come up with a narrative, right? And what was, what would that narrative be? <clears throat> and um, Kim liked this idea. She had always wanted to do her book herself. And so I presented this narrative to the people at the Blue Mountain Center. They encouraged me to continue. And then I hired this designer, uh, Toon van der Heiden, uh, from Amsterdam, who had been recommended to me by Stanley Green, uh, a dear colleague who since passed away. And the three of us created this book. And Tone met Kim several times, and we were all, um, we were all in it together in a way that took two and a half years. So what is this book? As part of Kim's own drawings, uh, this was her yes, no book, which had become her sort of moral compass when she didn't know what to do. She imagined this book in her head with flipping pages. And if, if at the end it landed on yes, then she would run and if it landed on no, then she would stay or the other way around. And so um, this is how she describes it. I'll just leave it on the screen for a second so you can read it. And I'll read it out loud. I didn't have a make a believe, believe friend when I was small to tell me the best thing to do. I had this big book in mind that would flick through the pages on its own. And there would be the answer straight in front of me with a bright glow, yes or no, simple and safe. Shall I run away or just stay? I wonder if the answer I knew deep down that I was doing the right thing. This was her passport picture that I re-photographed several times. Um, and we realized in the, in the making of the book that it kind of looks like this moon and the moon is a recurrent theme in the book. Kim would talk about the moon. It's also the passage of time. Um, we photographed this during moonlight in Central Park. This is a note she wrote to me saying, Nina, if I die, you can talk to me through the moon. And so, one of the beautiful things about making a book is that you, you have pictures and you're not sure why they're there. You just kind of have them. And then as you start to put them together and to figure out what story you're telling, you realize that, oh, they're, t they're, they're kind of magically connected. Um, and a good designer can help you do that. Uh, I went back to London. I retraced some of, uh, Kim's old steps. I went to her hometown. Uh, this was a very exciting moment because I would be in London and I would text her and I'd photograph the place I was at and I'd say, hey, is this what you're talking about? So let me just, so for instance, this is a spot on the River Thames where her abuser once threw her in the water. And so I'd be walking on the Thames and I'd say, hey, is this the spot? And then she'd say, yeah, yeah, that's it, or, or move a different, you know, move a little bit further this way. And this was like so exciting for us. Um, again, this is the phone booth in her little town when she used to um, run away from her home and go inside this phone booth and call this hotline, uh, the Good Samaritans, and explain to them that she was um, in a very violent situation. So I found the phone booth um we also in the design just put pictures together so we put her drawings on top of my pictures and and please know that i had never worked this way as a photographer i had come from in some ways a somewhat traditional aesthetic practice um you know photojournalism you don't mess with the image you don't crop you don't you know combine things 
um, that the frame is, you know, um, the integrity of the frame and all of that. And we kind of threw a bunch of this stuff up in the air and, and changed it a bit. Now these practices seem very normal, but at the time, um, I think it was still a little bit groundbreaking for, you know, documentary practice. I also, um, just took pictures of Kim after we would have conversations. So this is in my apartment. So, you know, what story did I want to tell about her? And what story did she want to be told about her? And fundamentally, it's a story of someone who is trying to survive um, in the midst of trauma in a city which can be tremendously harsh and cruel as a black woman in a city um, where law enforcement criminalizes black and brown people as we see today. Um, but I also wanted to show, as did she, that there were moments where people were super kind to her and I would come upon these people as well. And so when I would interview her, these were some of the stories I wanted to hear. So for instance, this is a story she told me about the subway. It was kind of crowded on the train, but there was this space and this lady said, come and sit down next to me for a minute. And I thought, oh no, here we go. She's going to give me a lecture about rehab. But she didn't. She just wanted to talk to me. She had seen me for years. I told her my favorite color and that I liked animals and I wanted to work with kids and I was born in England and I should leave it at that because the rest is the long story. Um, Kim told me another story that she would hang out at this one subway station because this one woman like smiled at her once. And so at a certain time of day, she would go there just so she could see this person smile at her. Because people, you have to realize that if you're living on the street, you are very often faced with looks of either people don't look at you because they don't want to see you, or they look at you in disgust, or you yourself may feel humiliated. And so to have someone acknowledge you in this very deeply human way is tremendously important. Um, I would, um, Kim would have various um, hospital visits and I would go and visit her. And um, the first thing she would do is draw when she would get there and so, and then put these pictures up on the wall. And so, um, this was also a way to, inc to incorporate her voice through her drawings. Sorry, that segue didn't seem to make much sense at that moment. <laughs> um, I, looking at this picture now, if I didn't know Kim, I would feel very uncomfortable taking this picture of someone I didn't know, right? And um, because I would feel that it's important to know their whole history, right? Or at least piece of the history. I teach a class at Columbia in photo students and I make them go out and talk to homeless people. And the rule is you can't photograph anyone sleeping. You can't photograph anyone who doesn't give permission, right? And you have to talk to them and you have to explain to them that you know what you wanna do is to post their story on social media and you have to show them a social media feed. And so all, you know, and then if they don't wanna do it, well, then you walk away. And so, but, so when I put this picture out, I would never put it out as just a single image. It's like exists in the whole book. Does that make sense? And in the book, it's paired with this drawing that Kim, Kim did of a memory of her mom walking away from her and crying. So, um, and this picture is, you know, I think also about, um, a sense of separation and my own loneliness sometimes in doing this work. 110th Street was an important street for us. I live kind of on the white side of 110th Street and she was camping out on the black side of 110th Street. And when we would leave each other, um, there was this moment also of um, even just leave each other for the day it was like, will we see each other again? Will Kim make it through another day? You know, why is it that I live on the white side and she lives on the black side? And so 
this um, picture was really about me, you know, and about the sense of division and separation. We, uh, you know, after our, you know, first we started with letters, me and her, but then of course, as technology changed, we moved into um, text messaging and everything else. And so um, I included some of these text messages in the book. And also this is Kim Selfie. And, um, and one of my favorite pictures of her from 1990 and the, um, and a passage from her diary, which reads, I remember things, well, most of them so clearly in my mind, my eyes used to be so big and wide open, taking in everything around me like a video recorder, but now they don't want to, they look round in care, half closed, hoping not to see anything that hurts. And when they do, they turn away quickly. Not like when I was young, I would stare in the hope of understanding what I'm seeing. My eyes are streetwise, and if you look closely, you will see the pain in my eyes. My eyes are the ways into my memories of fear and everything I've seen, and somewhere in there is the real me. Um, so, okay, I just wanted to sh show you a couple of pictures from when we launched this book, which was really cool because uh, people showed up from her program, and um, one of her longtime social workers showed up, and we were able to do a bunch of public presentations together. I believe there's one recorded at the Bronx Documentary Center, which was really like a very moment, momentous occasion for the two of us to present this work together. We also presented privately to some agencies dealing with addiction. Um, and I presented it at um, medical, um, medical associations. And when I do that, I usually put slides like this in, like Kim would like to add, right? Because I think this is very important. If I'm presenting work, it shouldn't just be me talking. If she can't be there, she should be able to say something. So these are some of the things that um, she has said in the past, which is, um, I asked her what her best hospitals was, like what was the treatment that really worked for her, and she talks about you know, um, um, being put in restraints and how this was so traumatizing for someone because they felt that they were being imprisoned again and, um, and the kind of nightmarish conditions at Kings County Hospital in New York. And, and this was very important information when I presented it to, um, you know, medical professionals in New York City. Um, she also talks about trauma and addiction Either someone is traumatized and decides to use drugs to cope with the pain or the person uses drugs and then gets traumatized by the lifestyle and dangerous situations they might find themselves in. And I think this is important for us to understand for those of us who are photographing trauma and addiction. And I think a final word is the system might have given up on me, but I never, never gave up on myself. Um, I'm just going to kind of go back to beginning here um, and stop my screen sharing um, so you can see me. Yeah, so um, before we take questions, I just want to give a little update. Um, the pandemic's been very difficult for people who suffer from mental illness or addiction because all of a sudden their, their programs are closed and they have to shelter in place. And um, this was Kim's um, predicament for several months in New York City. And um, I just want to put that out there for people as we consider all the ramifications of the pandemic and how difficult it is for people who rely on socialization through social services. And, um, but other than that, she's doing good. <laughs> wow, so, uh, so glad to hear she's, she's doing like a good. marathon. <laughs> um, Thank you so much uh, for sure. the presentation. I, you know, I've got a copy of your, your book, and the first time I opened it up, um, I'm not going to lie to you, I got about two pages in, and I said, I, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can, if I can uh, go through this, because you, all of a sudden, you, you immediately see how painful it's going to be when she talks about the abuse that she suffered um, and so forth. So I, I know this is, uh, uh, you put a lot of yourself in this book, and Kim put a lot of herself in this book as well. 
And what I really like, and I think is significant is that you're not telling a story about her, you're telling it with her. I mean, this is, um, but it's well, been described a collaborative process, right? Yeah, so there's nothing in the book that Kim didn't want, that she didn't sign off on, that we didn't decide together. So she was a photo editor of the book as well. Um, and there was never any like big fights about this. It was just, you know, you don't want it, it doesn't go in. There was one picture I kind of liked, but for her it sort of triggered these creepy, creepy references. So we took it out and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like, oh, but I need my picture in there. It was anything like that. Um, I see Kim as a, as a deeply creative person. And so for me, I could never have imagined ever putting this book out in any other way. I mean, I, the book wouldn't exist unless it was collaborative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, for what those her, of you- What just, was her reaction? Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. For those of you who want to see more, we also did a video of, that we came out with about eight months after the book was done because I had been shooting a lot of video during this time too. And you can find that on my website if you want to look. It's It gives a different, a, a different uh, well, she's more present, right? Because that's what video does. And so if you're interested, I, you know, you can look at the video there. But I'm sorry, Joe, what were you saying? I was just gonna um, ask, what was her first reaction when she actually held the book in her hands? I know she saw, saw galleys and, and proofs, but what, when, when the book actually came out and she was able to, to see it? She was surprised how pretty it was because it's a very pretty book. It's a thick book and the cover has a texture and that was important. And um, there's a very good interview that she did with the New York Times that I encourage people to read if they want to, where she talks about, I like that I can open it and close it, right? Yeah. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and, and we're gonna just dive right into some, some questions. And I'm gonna turn, um, uh, your mic, when, well, I'll say your name and then I will um, turn your mic on and, and you may have to unmute yourself. Um, uh, the first question is from Matthew Rothman. Um, Matthew, if you're there, go ahead and unmute your mic and uh, ask your question. Hi, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Hi Nina. Nina. Hi, Nina. Um, uh, I was wondering if you could describe um, how this process of working with Ms. Witch um, parallels and diverges from your other work that you've done, like in particular the famous photograph of the Marine wedding and the massive amount of time that I know that you've spent with Ty um, Ziegel um, and his family. And there seems to be a lot of parallels in there, but some divergences or your other work, which um, from the war from Iraq and Afghanistan, where you really do get very close to your, your subjects. Um, and I think that's what distinguishes some part of your work. But this seems to have taken it to another level. And how do you think about that? And um, how do you kind of reconcile those two approaches or the like? I'd love to hear you talk, your thoughts on that. Sure, thank, thank you so much for the question. Um, I think um, the other work you referenced what sort of um, the commonality is that people have um, experienced trauma and are trying to find a new life, right? While living with trauma. And um, how do you photograph that? And so that the person isn't just seen as um, devastated, but as a kind of a complex, um, complex changing identity if that makes any sense. And how do you show love within that moment? And also the difficulties of um, connection when someone uh, is still going through trauma. So I think um, the loneliness of that person comes through in a lot of that work. Um, I would talk to Kim a lot about the loneliness when she was living on the street. Um, and so, but the process is was, in many ways utterly different and what I had at stake was completely different because um, yeah these stories of wounded vets and of Thai 
they're always part of my memories and who I am today. But I went home, right, afterwards, and I continued with my life. But Kim is part of my life. Like, we talk almost every day still. And so that was definitely never the case with any of these other, you know, um, people I photographed. And while with them, I may have felt close for like a short period of time, I can't ever claim anything beyond that. Um, but yeah, um, but that doesn't mean that I was like, oh, I'm the photographer, I'm coming in for a day or two and I'm just gonna take your picture and leave. I mean, there's always a lot of conversation and, um, and sharing of experiences and um, yeah, I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Um, the next question is from uh, Turjoy Chaudhry. Um, some of it's been covered in, in, in your talk, and, and, and but he, um, I'm going to let I'm going to turn your mic on Turjoy and allow you to um, ask a question to, to Nina. You'll just need to unmute yourself. Hi, Nina. It's really great to have you here, and thanks for arranging this amazing webinar. So my question was: I completely get. Uh, get it that uh, it's a personal relationship, it's a long-term relationship, and at a point you uh, made the book. So my question was, uh, when first uh, did the idea of making this book uh, come into your mind, and uh, how this book contributed more into uh, your relationship with Kim? Uh, and uh, please, like, I would like to know more about uh, the art making process and uh, the relationship between you and him. So how, how these things are uh, connected or related or yeah. anything like that. Thank you very much for your question. Um, I didn't think about doing a book really until a, a few years before the book was published. So it wasn't something that I thought about from the beginning, which I think is, maybe different than how, you know, or a unique part of this story because a lot of the stories about, you know, <laughs> I didn't want a photographers for many years. Like I had no interest. Um, and then I started to have interest and I became really exciting to photograph her when we started dreaming up pictures, right? So the pictures would often be, I'm going to visit Kim wherever she's at, often maybe in a situation of crisis where she calls me, Nina, I need some help. And then I'll go and I was photographing her while I was there. But then as we started to do the book, we started to dream up pictures together and say, oh, we should go to this place or let's make a portrait. Or I would, you know, I started reading her notes and she would talk about the moon. I thought, okay, I need to now go out and make pictures of moons. And I started to imagine how do I, how do I visualize this narrative of her crossing the ocean from England to the United States? And, and what are the colors and what are the lights? And, you know, and so I started photographing oceans and subways and things like that were sort of abstract of New York. And this was really um, exciting to be able to make beautiful pictures out of what had been for a long, long time, a story, you know, deeply depressing and painful and um and it's hard to watch a person get sicker and sicker you know and um and to feel as though that maybe nothing can ever save her and i have to tell you during the course of the book and making of the book which went through lots of different versions you know i think it was like 17 pdfs um me and kim would joke that you know how are we going to end this book are you gonna live or are you gonna die, you know? And we, we would openly talk like that because it was unclear. So for me, making the book then was really, I need something to hold on to her, this person in case she dies, right? And then the book became, um, for us, really something, um, something that wasn't just about then, you know, our relationship of me going to Kim when she was in crisis, right? It became a lot more of just us hanging out and just liking each other. And uh, you see a lot of that in the video. I hope that answered your question. 
I, I wanted to, to go back to, to that, um, and you mentioned in your talk and just now about the gap. When you stopped, you, knew, you decided this, you know, she's not a subject for me right now, she's a friend, and you stopped for a number of years. As a storyteller, do you have regrets because you have a gap in sort of that, uh, in that period when you're putting the book together, you're going, oh, I missed that. What, 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 what was your yeah. thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, thanks. Um, I didn't have any regrets at the time, but yeah, when we started putting it together, it became, you know, a creative problem. And the book itself, the narrative was very complicated because it's two different countries. It's over a different, you know, long period of time. There's two different names. There's me and Clem, there's documents. There's like all these voices in there. And how do you put them together? And then how do you visualize this moment? Well, all these years when there was nothing. And so what took the place of my pictures was um, some of the documents and, um, and also creating the book as a kind of flashback. Right. And then um, what really helped in the overall uh, structure of the book was when I went back to England. But yeah, in some ways, I do regret a little bit not having those pictures. But um, but really, it just would have been like one or two, sure. you know, because it's not like the, the book doesn't run in like 1990 to 2015 and let's have a picture for each year, you know. Yeah. Thank you. I'm uh, going to take a question here from Anas Kamal. Uh, Anas, if you're there, I've unmuted you. I've allowed you to talk, so uh, just unmute your mic and, and ask your question. Are you still there? Okay, there she is. Hi. Hi. Okay, so, okay, uh, my name is not Anas, actually, it's Mariam, but, but my friend Anas, he sent me the link, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm a girl. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, and uh, uh, I, my question uh, is regarding uh, the medium used uh, to document her story. Like I've seen uh, the video, and I just was wondering if uh, if uh, if you could explain to me uh, why you felt uh, the need to also make a video uh, with the book. And uh, I always find myself confused uh, between uh, like uh, whether. Uh, being in the moment, uh, I find myself confused whether to take a picture or a video of it or which speaks louder or expresses the situation better. Uh, so uh, I'd like to know your thought on that. And, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, yep. that's it. Kim is very funny. And I didn't know how, know how to make funny pictures of her. But she's very funny. And she's a, like a terrific storyteller and really charming, engaging personality. But my pictures didn't show that. And so um, that's a real, that was, you know, a real problem. I think my pictures in some ways were a lot more about, or a lot about me, like my sadness and not being able to help her as much as she needed. And, but in the video, she's like a, she's a real character. And so, that's why we did the video and also um but it was a very sloppy process so i don't have a good formula for you to solve you know a real problem which is when do you take a photograph and when do you take the video and so the video is pretty choppy which is one reason why we did this um uh um what's it called two channel video <laughs> to deal with the fact that my video was so bad, right? And that, that I couldn't get like a three minute beautiful clip. So we kind of broke it up into two channels and the video was taken over over the years, right? Um, but I think that for me right now in my practice, I'm more interested in video um, and want to do it better. But in terms of a recommendation, for you, I would say that it's very hard to do video and stills at the same time, and even harder to do them on the same camera, right? It's possible, but I think you have to ask your, you know, if you really want to get good at video, then you should say, I'm just going to shoot this as a video. I'm going to look for moving images, not still images, right? I'm going to look for how sound and, 
and images uh, connect together. And so, yeah. I also had a brilliant editor and sound designer help me with the video, Elise Blenner has it, and so I just want to call out to her. Excellent. Um, I'm going to, um, uh, Molly Roberts, Molly, if you're out there, uh, you're allowed to talk, you just need to unmute your mic. Hi, Nina. Hey, Thanks. Molly, so nice to see you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for sharing your process and the complexity of the story. I have, I have invited some of my students to listen in. Great. And I thought, um, I, when you were talking about uh, when to photograph and when not to photograph is such an interesting um, process too. And students are now, you know, dealing with this complex world of COVID-19, isolation, George Floyd protests, racial injustice, and white privilege. Do you have any further words of advice for them? <laughs> <laughs> and also, is this the first time you decided that the form needed to be collaborative? Yes, this is the first time. Um, two, one thing I do want to say, one of the things I didn't photograph is Kim getting high on crack, Kim at crack houses in New York, Kim being strung out from crack, Kim buying crack. All these things I could have easily have photographed uh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to see them. I didn't want to perpetuate these kind of stigmatizing stereotypes. I didn't want the story reduced into one picture of crack user. The only pictures you see of the book of crack at all is those early pictures in London. Okay, so I think that for your students, the other questions, I think you have to ask yourself as image makers, all of us, what's your intention in telling this story? What can you learn by telling this story? Are you willing to learn? Or are you just there to be reactive to what's in front of you? Um, will you listen and talk to people? Are you the right person to tell the story? You know, I photographed a lot of police violence in New York for many, many years. The first funeral I ever attended as a person was a funeral of a young boy shot dead by a New York police officer. And I done so many stories of families who've lost their children or their loved ones to bullets by police. But you know, I kind of stopped telling that story around 2017, because I felt this is a story also, you know, I'm a white woman. Yes, I live in New York City. Yes, I want to document abuses by the New York Police Department. But am I the right person to tell this story right now? Maybe not, you know? And that's okay with me. It should be. Um, so I think it's just good to always kind of ask yourself, why are you there? How can you contribute? What is it that you have that you can offer? You know, not just what is it that I'm going to see something and take it. Thank, Great thank answer. You. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Um, I want to go back to, to your, your book, Homeland, where you talk about the militarization of um, American life post 9-11. I mean, we've got tanks in the street here in D.C. right now, and, and yeah. everything, all, you know, pictures of, of the uh, police and their military, you know, gear and so forth. Uh, how did that, how is this striking you as far as, like, you know, your book came out 15 years ago? Or 2008, so? 12 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Well, it's, it's all totally predictable, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean... I think the people who are surprised by it, they should take this moment and study why it was so predictable and do their very best to move forward so that we stop it now. Because I see these curfews, especially this one still going on in New York, as in no way, shape or form designed to make us safe, okay? I see this as almost an experiment See, how do, can we keep people inside? Two, it's also, and I hate to be so crass about it, a fantastic opportunity to uh, rack up overtime by the NYPD and criminalize hundreds and hundreds of people who will now have records, okay? Like a misdemeanor is still in New York State, a class B misdemeanor is still on your record. And, and so, you know, 
people, we all need to wake up to this. If this is, you know, something that you weren't aware of before, because we've, uh, if you, wherever you live, just look at your city budget, okay? How much goes to police departments? How, how have they expanded into all other social programs? You know, why is a police officer in our schools? Why? You know, why is a police officer sent when a person is having a mental breakdown? Why isn't a psychologist sent? And so anyway, um, but in, in the Homeland book, there's this interesting little sequence of pictures from a SWAT um, practice uh, event that I went to in Florida. And they look like they should be in, you know, Iraq. You know, we're all Iraqis now. <laughs> I don't know whether to laugh or cry on, on that, but um, Alexandra Dole, a Alexandra, if, if you're there, I'm, uh, I've allowed you, enabled your uh, microphone, uh, just be sure to unmute yourself. Hi, Nina, thanks. Hi. Um, you were talking about the, the story of Kimberly's abuse, especially when she was little, and you said that it was for the reader, you wanted to let the reader do the work. I wanted to know what exactly does that mean and why? Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm really glad you asked this question. Um, so if you're presented, you know, with a story of, uh, that's a very violent story, right? And um, things maybe you never imagined were happening. How do you then communicate that story? How do you even verify it, right? So there's a whole other question about this book, like how did I know what she was telling me was true, you know? And so what I didn't want to do is open the book and have, you know, Kimberly Stevens had X, Y, and Z happen to her by these people at this time, and here are all the, you know, gruesome violent details. Because how, how is that a way to, in any shape or form, you know, express the complexity of all of this and so a reader that wants that is not going to be happy with my book but a reader that wants to get to know kim okay um and do the work meaning like the story isn't so readily revealed and there's a whole lot of documents and you have the the option to read them all or not read them all. But if you read them all, you will discover all of these little tangled elements. And by the end, you will come to a very deep understanding of why this young woman is lying out on the street in New York City. And so, yeah. And I think this is important for people who cover sexual violence or any kind of violence is that, you know, we, we saw this with the Yazidi, the, the Yazidi women in, you know, fleeing uh, ISIS. It's like a hundred journalists said, ah, you were raped, how many times? Uh, what was it like? How did it happen? I mean, it was just horrible ethical practices, unethical practices going on. And so um, I didn't want to perpetuate that kind of storytelling, you know? Thank you. I hope I answered your question. Uh, I, I, um, I turned her mic off after she asked the okay. question, but um, the next question is from Maria Moshe. Um, Maria, if, if you're there, I've um, enabled your mic. Just um, be sure to unmute yourself. Hi, Nina. This is Maria. Hey there. How are you? I'm okay. It's so nice to see you. You too. Um, <laughs> I think my question has been answered before, but um, I wonder what makes you decide to wrap up a long form um, story? Um, why um, you didn't do five years more? I, I, I heard that you, you said uh, before that you're afraid that something might happen to her. Um, but why then? Why earlier? You know? Yeah. Um, why at this point of time? Because I think um, 
I couldn't imagine anything else that would be terribly different that I, you know, kind of needed to share. Yeah. And so when I see Kim now, I, you know, sometimes I take pictures, sometimes I don't, but I don't ever, ever feel like, oh, damn, I wish this could have gone in the book. Like never mm. for a second have I thought that. Uh, you know, the, um, in the book, there's a, um, there's a character who um, was her abuser. And, and forgive me if I missed this in the book, but uh, did you, did, was there any, ever any justice as far as that person goes? Never. No, and so part, you know, anyone who's been abused, and you saw this a lot with the stories of the Catholic Church, um, there's the abuse, then there's the instruction to shut up, right? And then there's the threat of more abuse if they speak up. And uh, I mean, this is a classic bully behavior. We see this even with, you know, the Trump regime, you know? Do this, if you don't do it, you know, you're gonna shut up, and if you speak up, you're gonna be fired. Well, in someone who's, you know, violently abused, the stakes are much higher. And so keeping quiet, has been her mode of existence. But within that, she's always tried, and this is why she's such a remarkable individual, right? Is she's always tried to assert her story and tell her narrative. And she collected all these documents and made all these pictures and did this all, over, all through her whole time to show this has happened to me and happened to other people. And so, um, um, her book, and she says this, it's not for me. It's like her book was one way to say, hey, you know, excuse me, fuck you. I'm not being quiet anymore. And that's, you know, liberating. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, the, um, thank you. Uh, next question is uh, from some, uh, uh, someone I know, Chantelle Wong with, the, uh, with Focus on the Story. She's on our board of directors. Chantal, I've enabled your mic. Please um, unmute yourself. Oh, hi, Nina. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, this presentation. I was wondering sort of uh, um, um, current situation for uh, Kimberly, uh, you know, has the book and the proceeds of the book become a, a positive source, a positive face in her, in her life and given her some resources for a better life going forward? So, we split the book sales, but for anyone who knows about photo book publishing, there is no proceeds. Um, there's just debt by the photographer. So um, it hasn't been a kind of financial windfall, but it was never, that was never the point. Um, she uses the book as a kind of um, icebreaker when she's going to meet a new therapist and she will be like, here, this is me. So she doesn't have to recount her story for the endless thousandth time to a new therapist. Um, it's also been able to work for her in some situations that she could, you know, show that she was actually an authentic person, like a, you know, and not, and not just like a crack, cracked up woman on the street, you know, because it gave her a sense of legitimacy. Um, but, um, there's no financial windfall. Uh, I, I saw that uh, in one of your photos, she was at, at an opening of an, uh, an exhibit. Have you ever brought her to any of your talks? Has she ever appeared uh, in public talking about yeah. her? Yeah, we, we did this talk at the Bronx Documentary Center, which I think is online, which was really great, uh, like a pretty momentous evening. And, um, and then we did, um, another talk, I forget where, together. And then we did a, a private talk at the new school um, for other people who've um, experienced trauma who work in communities in New York City. And that was just a closed talk for about three hours. And um, we would like to do more. It's just, um, you know, if we're both up for it and if it's mm -hmm. both convenient at the time. 
the next question is from uh, Johanna uh, Paneo. Um, Johanna, uh, if you're there, um, I've enabled your mic. Please take yourself off mute. Um, hi, Nina, how are you? Hey, Joanna, how are you? I'm good, I haven't talked to you in so long. This is a wonderful presentation. Um, I was wondering, um, I've always been so impressed by your thought process um, as you work through the idea of ethical storytelling. And I was wondering, what are some resources that you maybe refer your students to or that you talk to them about? Um, because I know I've found, certainly found myself in situations where I'm not sure what to do and I have to really, you know, sort of go through it. So I'd be interested in what some resources or thoughts you might have on that. Um, the MPPA, National Press Photographer Association, has a good sort of um, ethics guideline. Um, and then I, I don't have like any sort of like go-to manual but I'm always showing them, you know, um, I miss Lens blog so much. I just have to say this, I really deeply miss New York Times Lens blog because um, you'd have people talking about their ethical practice and how they do things. And I would just constantly share, you know, some of that work with my students. But Joanna, um, after this is over, I'll look through and see what I have gathered together and I'll, just send it to you. Oh, thank you. I just, um, it's something that as I do some teaching that I want to continue to talk with my students about. And I think it's really, really important. Um, and it's becoming even more important if that's possible. But um, what I'd like to say, you know, you. is we would all do very well as photographers is we changed our language around photography. I was interviewed by someone the other day and he asked me, are you a sniper or a machine gunner? And I said, I am neither. I bet a male photographer um, gave you, you know, um, <laughs> asked you that question or, you know, I'm not a shooter. I make pictures. I don't shoot somebody. I don't capture. You know, when I started photography, this word capture was never in our language. And so when someone says, that's a great capture, I'm like, what does this mean? I didn't capture someone. I interacted and engaged. I witnessed, I observed. So we really need to change our language, which is the language of military occupation. <laughs> oh, wow, I can't believe the whole sniper. <laughs> sniper, but think of it. What I, I don't even use the word shooter anymore. I completely taken that out of my language for, oh, Number yeah, so that's a good first class for, you know, teachers out there. Thanks. Good to see you. You too. Thank you for your question. Um, did you, uh, there was an anonymous question. We don't turn on anonymous uh, questioners, but uh, the question was when she became, when did uh, Kathy become a ward of the state? And my question on top of that is, um, does she have any family or uh, to speak of? Are there people out there that she considers family besides yourself? Um, likely they still are, not in the US. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm always very careful about certain dates and things and certain things I blocked out, you'll see that there's, in the documents, there's things I blacked out. And this is for her protection. And also, um, yeah. Absolutely, okay. Um, the, um, yeah, I, 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 I wanted to recognize Maggie. Uh, she wrote a long um, note that, uh, that she put into the chat, but not everybody can see the chat. The, the folks on, on Facebook are, are not able to see that chat and um, you know, some of the people who will see the recording of this. Um, Maggie, are, are you out there? I'm gonna, I'm, I, I'd love to turn your, your mic on if you're, if you're there and just let, let you uh, uh, say something. You, you, of course, were the reason that um, I connected with, with Nina in the first place. So, so Maggie, I, I've turned your, your mic on. If, if you're there and you can unmute yourself. I'm here. 
Hi. Hi. Hi, Nicole. Hey, how are you doing, Maggie? Me and Maggie go way back. Yes, we do. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maggie, um, I, I, I just, I, I want to let you say a, a, a few words about Nina. You, you had a, a quite a long note that you put in the chat and just, um, you guys go back uh, many years. How did, how did y'all meet? And, and I saw that, you know, I, I don't think this is uh, hyperbole. You posted on your, on your um, Facebook page that uh, Nina may be one of the most important documentary photographers uh, today. So I, I'd love to, for you uh, to. Maggie, <laughs> come on. <laughs> I really feel that way, Nina, because um, I think you're a highly intellectual and intelligent person. Uh, we met many, many years ago. Um, it was when the U.S. went into Kuwait uh, to protect it because it had been invaded by was it Iran or Iraq? Iraq, I think. That was it. And so it was. Uh, we both ended up out uh, in New Jersey at um, that base that I can't now remember the name of, but, and I, I had never met Nina, but I saw this, I saw her from across the way and she looked so serious and I thought, I, she looked so serious, but I'm gonna go meet her. Um, and so she gave me a ride back to Manhattan and we became friends. And the thing that has always astounded me about Nina is that she really is ahead of the pack and that she's looking at things in a very different way, not just a visual way, but what things really mean. And she's always asking questions. Like just now, she was asking, why is it that they always send the police when uh, somebody's having mental challenges? Or, um, you know, why is it? She's always saying, why, 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 why? And then she tries to find the answer in, to her questions by using photography and then finding a way to make a picture that is about that answer uh, or what's going on around us. And I look at Homeland, and I've always thought this about Homeland as well, her book, on, uh, Homeland, which I've always thought she is so ahead of the curve and this is not the last we're gonna see this stuff. And I didn't mean just that people will always see that book, um, but that she was foretelling something. I almost think she's, at a crystal ball or something, and she sees ahead. But I also, what I love about Miss Wish is that <laughs> that she made Kimberly count for something. And uh, I think she helped Kimberly see that she mattered. And I think when we can do that with our work, that this is the most important thing we do. You know, it's not just about taking pictures and or winning awards or anything like that, it's really, that's what it should be about. And Nina, just every time she does something, she doesn't do it halfway, she picks it up, she carries it, she looks at it in every different way you possibly could, she asks questions, she questions herself, and uh, it's always something amazing. And she always collaborates with the people that she photographs, she includes them, very inclusive approach. And I just uh, think, that she's one of the most highly intelligent, talented uh, photographers in the world. And that's what I think. And I know a lot of photographers, so <laughs> I'm here to say she's the queen. <laughs> and um, she should wear that crown. And everybody should understand that there's a very special person here. And on top of that, she's just great fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, Maggie, you're so sweet. Yeah. I'm so grateful to know you because uh, I am so inspired by you. She's somebody who can inspire you. So look at her work because you will be inspired. You will learn uh, and you will see whole new ways to tell stories. Thank you so much, Maggie. Sorry to put you on the spot like that, but I, I, uh, I really wanted to, to hear your voice as well. So uh, thank you. Um, so we're, we're, we're getting to the, near near the end and um i want to uh thank you so much for uh everything uh sharing this story and and sharing kimberly's story um one question i i had uh is when did she transition from from kathy wish 
to Kimberly Stevens as she's known today. How, how did that happen and, um, and what was her, her, um, were her reasons for that? Or how did she pick the name Kimberly Stevens? I'm not gonna answer that. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's 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 okay. It's not that I just yeah. Um, it's kind of mentioned in the book, but it's a very long conversation and not one that I want to have publicly. Sure. Um, but what I would like to say, if you don't mind, is um, is kind of bring us back to like the moment now. Is um, for those of us who've been out on the street photographing these protests. Um, maybe it's the first time you've encountered protesters saying they don't want their pictures taken. They don't want their faces seen. Um, for us as journalists, this is just like insanity. Also, we figure you go to a protest, it means that you know that you're going to be photographed, if not by surveillance, by police, by cameras out there, by the participants themselves. You know, how could someone rightfully ask this of us? But you know, I'm starting to have a different opinion. And I just want to share, if I have a minute, an experience I had in New York the other night. Please do. Um, so I was at um, an event at Gracie Mansion, which is the mayor's house. And there was about a few hundred people that were gathering close to the curfew. And the organizer said, we've asked the press not to show any faces. We've also asked you not to show any faces or you know, ask people first if you're going to. And now we're gonna sit here for half an hour. And you had several hundred people sitting on the street in silence for half an hour. The only sound you heard were the NYPD helicopters circling above, surveying the group. And if he hadn't given that instruction, I probably would have moved not so quietly through that space, or not as quietly as I then did, right? And taken a lot more pictures, but instead, I took very few pictures. And I became part of the moment, you know? And felt the pain and the importance of that moment. And I changed how I photographed. And I tried to do what he asked me to do. And it didn't seem like such a horrible request afterwards. And I felt like, myself and the people in the group got something out of not photographing so much in that moment. Because you also didn't see everybody live streaming, right? And so, you know, when someone says, oh, don't take my face, don't do this, don't do that, instead of like thinking, what right do they have to say that? It's a public space. Really deeply think about why they might say that and what can you do to understand that? And how can you make this little adjustment, you know, if it warrants it? So I learned something from that name. I, I think that's um, it's a very good um, point. And I think the subject you're touching upon is going to take a lot of, a lot of discussion, a lot of um, soul searching and, and just um, talk, because I know it's, it's going to divide the photojournalism community. Um, pretty pretty sharply in, in many respects and and um yeah it, it's it but we need to be thoughtful in that approach and i appreciate your your thoughtfulness on that um let, let me share my screen uh let's see so thank i want to thank everyone for for joining us and those uh we're still out there um i know it's hard sometimes with all the different options to um to tune in so i really appreciate um everyone that came out today uh the show will be recorded or has been recorded and will be posted on our website on our youtube page and a recording will be on our facebook page um if you don't have the book you should get it uh and you should buy it from Nina's website, uh, ninaberman.com backslash store. Uh, can't recommend it enough. Uh, it's been praised by everyone that's reviewed it. And um, you heard the story today. So really don't need to say much more about that. Um, 
I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, they, of course, allow us to do these programs every week uh, since the beginning of April. Thank you, Fujifilm. And as a side note, uh, if you tune into the Fujifilm forum in about 40 minutes, I'm going to be on there. So uh, come join me there. Uh, thank you, Fujifilm. Thank you, Tamron, Multiple Exposures Gallery, Peak Design, and Capital Photography Center, and KEH. The Sunday, we're going to be talking about protests and documenting protests and movements and revolutions. Uh, Sunday morning, 10 a.m., please come and join this special panel. Uh, Leslie deschler uh has created this panel. We have uh, some amazing guests, Sheila Prebright, Meg Handler, and Wara Vargas-Lara. Um, and we'll be showing some of their photos, and we'll be talking about the current climate and what's happening, and probably picking up on the discussion you just, you just had. Um, I'm sure we'll talk more about that on, on Sunday. So go to our website, focusonthestory.org, you'll find a link to be able to, to join us on Sunday. Hope to see you there. Uh, and stop sharing my screen. Nina, I want to give you the, the last word. So please, um, uh, it's your stage again. Leave us with some closing thoughts. Yeah, really just um, thank you all for, for tuning in. I've really valued these Zoom conversations. Um, and participated in some and just been an observer in others. And so um, thank you all for taking the time. I know that we're desperate to return to some sense of normalcy, but I just really, Joe, I'm just gonna like hand it to you and, and other people um, in charge of festivals and arts organizations, support these groups. This is the time um, if we wanna see them, you know, exist in the future and um, just be kind out there. That's about all I have to say. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for um, thank you for that. And it's been a pleasure. Um, and look forward to following your work uh, throughout this time. Uh, documentary photography is, you know, critical at this moment. Thank you, everyone. Uh, hope to see you on Sunday. Bye bye. Bye.